Welcome everyone to IISS and thank you very much for coming. My name is Matthew Harries, I'm the Managing Editor of Survival and a Research Fellow here at the Institute. And this is the latest uh, in a series of survival seminars where we host authors of articles in the Institute's journal, Survival, uh, to discuss their articles and to be questioned by their readership. Uh, past installments have, in, uh, have covered uh, the relationship between encryption and security, uh, the renewal of Trident and the future of the uh, liberal global order. Uh, and our speaker today is Dr. Dana Allen, who is editor of Survival, which is to say my boss, uh, and uh, IISS senior fellow for US foreign policy and transatlantic affairs. Uh, he is the author or co-author of seven books, most recently, Our Separate Ways, The Struggle for the Future of the US-Israeli Alliance, uh, which comes out uh, this June with Public Affairs, co-authored with Stephen Simon, latterly of IISS, uh, and before that, the uh, Senior Director for the Middle East on the US National Security Council. Dana is also the author of Donald Trump's America, a copy of which uh, you will have had on your seat, which is the closing argument in the most recent issue of Survival. And he'll be talking to us today about uh, the phenomenon that is Don Donald Trump, uh, what the Trump phenomenon uh, tells us about U.S. politics in 2016, and some broader thoughts on the state of the presidential race so far. Dana. Uh, Matthew, thank you very much. Um, we had a little bit of a back and forth about the title, uh, Donald Trump's America, uh, and whether it really conveyed the message that I was going to uh, uh, present here. So let me say at the outset, as a patriotic American, I don't think it is Donald Trump's America in the sense of a country transformed and contorted by authoritarianism and bigoted appeals. On the contrary, at one level, what you are seeing is a rearguard reaction against the palpable transformation of the United States towards diversity, openness, and for lack of a better word, liberalism. And I mean liberalism both in the sense of um, becoming more of a center-left country, which I'll talk about later, but also a liberalism in a broader uh, consensus terms that include or should include uh, mainstream conservative parties. Uh, nor do I think it is Donald Trump's America in the sense that he is going to be elected president of the United States. Um, president Trump is, a, is an exceedingly unlikely future, but not impossible. I mean, if he, he, he could get the nomination, and by definition, if he could get the nomination, that things could happen. Um, but in the last past few weeks, you could argue that it has also appeared that he is somewhat less likely that he will be the Republican nominee. Um, now, I would hold, withhold judgment on that one at this point. Tomorrow, wait, what's today, Monday? Yeah. Tomorrow is Tuesday, and he's going to win the New York primary, and I think he's going to win it big. Um, he has some other favorable states coming up, and he still could win the nomination outright on the first ballot. Moreover, it's very hard to predict what would happen if he arrived in Cleveland, something like 100 delegates short of a majority. Um, there are still many pressures. I mean, obviously, as I think you all know, uh, there are frantic efforts. I mean, I'm not sure how organized they are to, to try to deny him the nomination on, on subsequent uh, ballots. But as there are still many, as I say, there are still many pressures that could put it, push it in his direction. Not least the view of polled Republicans. Um, I mean, of course, this kind of question depends on how you ask the question and you get contradictory answers. But polls suggest that the majority of Republicans believe that the plurality leader should, be the, should win the nomination. Um, that's not how the rules work necessarily, but it is an <coughs> argu arguably an, an element of the process's legitimacy. We do not have enough experience. Actually, we do not have any experience in the age of primary-based, which is to say ostensibly democratic nomination contests, to know what will happen um, if, it's a, if it's a contested uh, convention. The last time it wasn't wrapped up uh, before the convention was 1976, when Gerald Ford faced a strong challenge from Ronald Reagan, and um, 
uh, put together his first ballot majority only at the convention. But these were very different dynamics, and um, Donald Trump is no Ronald Reagan. Uh, among other things, Reagan was not threatening a riot or other forms of violence if he was denied um, the nomination. Now, as Josh Marshall has very well explained, if Trump were a normal candidate, he, have, he would have won by now because his opponents would simply melt away. Um, even with only pl a plurality, as soon as it became clear that no one could catch him in the number of delegates, and no one will catch him in the number of delegates before the convention, his opponent's funding would dry up and they would bow to reality. Um, the difference this time, of course, is that he's unacceptable to large numbers of Republicans and almost a sure loser in November. Uh, although how much of a factor that is is, is complicated by the fact that uh, the, his, his, you know, the, the, the most, his most prominent or most likely alternative also looks like a loser in November. That's Ted Cruz. Um, so anyway, he may or may not be the nominee, but I think it's um, at least premature to conclude that he won't be. It is Donald Trump's America in the tautological sense that Trump is the big story of, two, of the 2016 primary cam campaign and his phenomenal rise and endurance must tell us something about the state of the nation. And so what, what does it tell us? I want to focus on three things. First, what does it say about Republican politics? Second, is there a parallel on the Democratic side um, in the also somewhat surprising success of Bernie Sanders? And third, are there foreign policy and international relations implications that are going to survive his likely defeat? Um, let me start with Republican politics. Because of the surreal, dreamlike, celebrity circus nature of what's going on, we really should never lose sight of the fact that the central motif of his campaign is racism. It embraces Islamophobia and anti-immigrant xenophobia, but it's fundamentally racist. Um, again, I don't think this says something um, particularly damning about Donald Trump's America. Uh, there's been huge progress in the United States, not least, not um, you know, most obviously marked by the election of a black president. Um, when, when talking about the racism of his campaign, it, it should go without saying, but it's worth repeating that the nature of his personal attitude towards blacks, Hispanics, and even Muslims is not really relevant. Um, the racism, racism as a strategy is unquestionable. Uh, Trump has been around for a long time as a, as a figure in New York and as a, um, as a, as a, as a reality TV star, um, as a, 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 as a phenomena of, of uh, New York celebrity magazines and culture. Uh, but he, as I, as I point out strongly in my article, he came to political prominence with one idea, which was that Barack Obama was not legitimately president of the United States. He was he was he was a birther, and this is this was his claim to fame when he was flir flirting with um, with a run for the presidency in 2012, and indeed when Mitt Romney embraced his endorsement, um, birtherism, the completely uh, there, there are no words to describe of the up is down nature of the claim that Barack Obama was not born in the United States could only be about one thing, which was the color of his skin and the fact that his father was born a Muslim. Um, and, you know, race remains, it has been arguably the central drama of American history and it remains a powerful factor. Um, so that's one thing we can't lose sight of. Um, I mean, the second question is the degree to which uh, the Republican Party has bought, the, bought itself this on itself, and I think this is a matter of maybe discussion in, in Q&A, but um, 
I have strong views about it, but rather than express my views, I'm going to quote uh, one of the prime foreign policy thinkers of the Republican Party, Robert Kagan, who wrote recently, and I quote him at some length in my piece, that Trump, well, he starts off with an Oedipus um, analogy and says that Trump is the natural consequence, and here I'm quoting, of the party's wild obstructionism, the repeated threats to shut down the government over policy and legislative disagreements, the persistent calls for nullification of Supreme Court decisions, the insistence that compromise was betrayal, the internal coups against party leaders who refused to join the general demolition. He goes on to talk about the party's attacks on immigrants, its trafficking in Islamophobia, and then speaks of, and again I'm quoting, the drumbeat of Obama hatred, a racially tinged derangement syndrome that made any charge plausible and any opposition justified. This is Robert Kagan, who is known to many of you um, as not a vegetarian, at least in foreign <laughs> policy terms. Um, But the third question, I guess, um, and, and one, you know, not to be completely dismissed and also not to be over enlarged, is, is, is the question of what he has appealed to in, a, in, in economic and sociological terms to an important constituency of the Republican Party, let's call them non-educated whites, that in a certain sense have never really bought, bought into um, the, the ideological and economic verities of the Republican establishment. Trump is not a conventional American conservative on questions of middle class welfare support, free trade, and so forth. Um, we can argue that for reasons partly due to their kind of, you know, their cosmopolitan, the, the cosmopolitan definition of American liberalism today, the Democratic Party has not really, at least this group of, of, has not seen the Democratic Party as serving its interests either. Now this is a question, um, I mean this does raise long-term questions about what happens um, to American and, and frankly Western uh, developed politics um, if income distribution continues to, to to widen, if middle class wages remain stagnant. I mean, one could get rather dark in scenarios and talk about um, artificial intelligence uh, wiping out whole sectors of jobs and, and removing the, the sense of a middle class job as the capitalist mechanism for distributing income. I think, you know, these are things to worry about in the future, and it's arguable that Trump is, is um, is exploiting the, the, the early stirrings of anxieties about this future. Uh, and this brings me to the democratic si side. If, if, if these kinds of uh, concerns about income distribution, for example, are a factor in empowering Trump, could that also explain the appeal of Bernie Sanders on the democratic side? So let me say a few things about, about the Democrats and, and about Sanders. First of all, Sanders is no Jeremy Corbyn. He calls himself a democratic socialist. He speaks of breaking up banks, of raising the minimum wage, of establishing free education at state universities and a single-payer health system. But he's not actually talking about socializing anything, except maybe medical insurance companies, and I'm not sure he's really thought that through. Um, my, my point is he's proposed nothing so socialist as the National Health Service in this country. He just calls himself a socialist. But real, the content of his socialism is advanced New Deal liberalism. Um, you know, it's also the case that, and, and Jamie Bui in, in Slate Magazine this morning uh, had a long column making this point, he's not so unique insofar as Democrats usually, or at least very often, have an insurgent candidate who appeals mainly to white liberals. Um, I mean, we can start, we can, can include Gene McCarthy, Bill Bradley, John Dean, not Barack Obama for reasons, for important reasons that I, I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, 
so in that sense, this is it, his challenge is not necessarily all that new. It is nonetheless, I'd say, significant that someone who calls himself a socialist has so much support, um, particularly youth support. I think it does indicate that for American youth, free market capitalism is no longer a shibboleth and socialism no longer, as a word, is no longer anathema, at least in abstract terms. There's striking poli polling data on this change, which really is a change. Um, and the, the association of the youth with it is actually quite a change too. In the, 19th and in the 60s and 70s, which was a time of you know, obvious youth rebellion, young voters in general were, no, were at least as conservative as their elders. Um, I mean, this was in fact the Ronald Reagan generation. And this is significant. The leftism of the current youth is significant because age cohorts tend to develop a political and ideological identity um, when they first become interested in politics, and they tend to stick with it. Uh, this, along with the fact that America will be a majority minority country in about 20 years, is evidence, I would say, for the thesis that after a conservative ascendancy in American politics that lasted from roughly 1968 to 2006, we are entering a period of center-left majority. Now, this is complicated. First of all, it's a prediction about the future, which is obviously worth what predictions about the future are. Things can change. The country right now is still pretty evenly balanced, and the right has a lock on the House of Representatives and in fact most state houses in the United States. So institutionally, the Republicans are in a very strong position. Nonetheless, those House majorities were won in 2010, 2012, and 2014, despite the fact that in each of those elections, more Americans voted for Democratic candidates for the House than for Republican candidates. I mean, that's just the way it is. There's a kind of natural gerrymandering in the, gerrymandering in the United States having to do with the fact that urban districts are so disproportionately left-wing um, that a lot of votes are wasted there. Um, it's also the case, though, that if Hillary Clinton is elected president, Democrats will one have won the popular vote in six of the last seven, well, including that one, six out of seven uh, presidential elections. Will she win? I have to say, uh, and it's interesting because at this point when I give talks on this subject, I learn something from my audience often. Um, uh, the hostility that I encounter to Hillary Clinton and the hostility that's clear in the polls does surprise me a bit. She is not very popular in the country at large. I never thought she was a hugely talented politician and she concedes, concedes as much, but the hostility does surprise me. Uh, she's been around for a long time. She's been well known for a long time. There's a su the suggestion that the the image that she has of scheming and ruthlessness, you know, frankly, I think stems from I don't, maybe it's too strong to call them smears, but an attitude that developed in the 1990s that was resonant because at that time there was not really a general acceptance of a strong and, and independent career woman being um, the first lady of the United States. Uh, and you know this image without actual content, I think, defined her. Um, the suggestion of corruption, and I, I hear this from my students. Um, well, they don't have any specifics, but there's this idea that she's corrupt. I think this is unsupported, but it does indicate a kind of reaction to, um, let's call it the wealthy establishment in the United States, um, which is part of these larger trends we may be talking about. Um, what will almost certainly give her the Democratic nomination, though, is the nature of the Democratic Party. And this comes back to why I said Barack Obama was not an insurgent uh, candidate, like Sanders or others. The key to Barack Obama's uh, nomination victory in 2012, the top, when he started winning the nomination, is when he started winning the black vote, which was, which was actually quite resistant to him at first. 
It was resistant to him because it didn't take him seriously. And, you know, black voters in the United States, I mean, the Democratic Party, I said the United States will be majority minority in about 20 years. Um, the Democratic Party is majority minority. And it is, uh, you know, the, the linchpin of that, of that coalition is, is the black vote, which is viscerally pragmatic. Um, it is, you know, the, the Sanders team is perplexed that um, American blacks to whom he thinks he, on economic terms, um, because of his history in the civil rights movement, although Clinton also had a history in the civil rights movement, but it just seems to, on paper that he should appeal to American blacks, but he doesn't. And I think it's because um, the average black voter, and here I think you have to think I don't know if this is average, but a characteristic black voter would be a church-going middle-aged woman is viscerally pragmatic. She has been around a long time. She's not particularly interested in soaring rhetoric or untethered claims that a political revolution is going to change America, because she knows America pretty well. Um, I mean, there's also the fact that the black community in the United States, in political terms, has a long association uh, with, um, with the Clintons, but I actually think this <coughs> innate pragmatism is, is, is more important. Um, and is the answer, you know, Sanders said the other day or the other week that um, his victories are more important than Clinton's because <coughs> she's dependent so much on the South, which is the most conservative region in the country. Um, but it, 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 the Democratic vote in the South that she has depended on is overwhelmingly black. What about, um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish in a moment, um, foreign policy and international relations. What does the Trump phenomena tell us? The word isolationism is thrown about so often and so carelessly that it's actually quite useful to see an example of the real thing. Donald Trump is the real thing. Um, he says that Japan and South Korea should develop nuclear weapons to end their dependence on the United States. NATO is a bad deal for the United States and it needs to either be amended or ended. Um, the Trump view of America's role in the world is purely transactional, and transactional in narrow terms. And um, his signature slogan is that America has been getting a rotten deal. And it has some resonance. Complaining about allies' free writing is not new, of course. Bob Gates and Barack Obama have both done so recently. But Trump does convey the sense he has this concept of the deal. That's the most important thing, and, and his concept of the deal means finally doing something about the, the bad deal that the United States has had with the rest of the world. Now, an important subsidiary is his rejection of the liberal consensus on free trade. Um, this is something that Josh Marshall has also emphasized, and it's very important. He's <coughs> possibly the first... Well, he's not the first. Maybe Ross Perot represented it as well. But uh, if he becomes the Republican nominee, he will certainly be the first major party nominee that serves you know, an anti-free trade uh, constituents, constituency, which is in a certain sense underserved. Uh, I think that's a, a matter that could be significant for the future. Uh, but it has to do with... Uh, with the whole sense of whether the era of, of liberal institutional free trade may be endangered in, in a broader sense. Now, the, um, the issue of, uh, of survival, which um, Matthew has mentioned, which has my article in it, uh, and which it, I think will be the only issue of survival with a picture of Donald Trump on that cover, but we we can't guarantee that, uh, is, ha has the sort of main title, Sovereignty and Disorder. Well, the lead article is by Michael Boyle, 
uh, an associate professor at La Salle University. What's the title of his article? The Coming, coming Illiberal Order. The Coming Illiberal Order. That's a slight overstatement of his thesis. Uh, like all good titles. Like all good titles, <laughs> like Donald Trump's America. But, you know, it is, it, it, is, it is a worthwhile question to ask, is Trump part of a bigger rise of, let's say, illiberalism in, in Transatlantica? Um, and, you know, here there are worrying signs. Hungary and Poland have explicitly illiberal governments. Um, they're not part of, I mean, they're, they're new uh, members of the West, but it's certainly worrying the direction where they're going. Uh, any illusions about a liberal future for Russia are good and dead. Doyle's um, argument is that uh, not that illiberal states are taking over the international system, but they are asserting their place in it. And what this essentially moves means is that the dial of international consensus is going to have to move back a bit um, from, from the liberal consensus as established uh, <coughs> in the post-war period, and he has a very interesting and sophisticated <laughs> argument about the relationship between domestic liberal consensus and liberal international order. Um, some of you, I quoted, quoted in my piece, but some of you have probably seen Anna Applebaum's um, column worrying that we could be three elections away from the demise of the West. I mean, that's what her headline said, but she said in her article, Liberal International Order. The three elections she worries about are Brexit, uh, Trump, and Marine Le Pen. Uh, as I've said, of these three, President Trump strikes me at least, at least President Trump strikes me as very likely, but it's not impossible. And Applebaum points out elections are tricky things, another big terrorist attack in the United States at a certain time, who knows. Um, is Hillary Clinton literally slipping on a banana peel? I mean, many things could happen. Um, let, me, let, me, let me finish on just a couple faintly positive notes. Um, first, it has not been an edifying Republican nomination fight. However, surprisingly, I do see one thing positive to come out of it from Trump's outrageousness. Uh, and that is actually in the debate regarding torture. One of the most shocking things to me after Obama's 2008 election uh, was his effort and the opposition of Republican leaders to reestablish an unequivocal consensus, political consensus, against torture in the United States. He established this, he, he established this, he reestablished this prohibition um, as a matter of policy, but the fact that it was still debated politically was very worrying. Uh, you know, with honorable exceptions like John McCain and I think Lindsey Graham, it was quite it, it was quite shocking. Trump may have done something positive in that regard because he has actually been so outrageous that he has forced other candidates to take a stand. So, for example, uh, Ted Cruz um, he doesn't go far enough in my view. He insists on definitional quibbles about whether waterboarding is torture. But he says we shouldn't reinstate waterboarding. Uh, and um, he has come out, actually, with some fairly forthright language uh, against uh, Trump's explicit call for, calls for torture. Um, the second thing I would say, and uh, since I'm out of time, I will elaborate this. Hillary Clinton probably will win, and she's going to win by running for a Barack Obama's third term, which is actually a very difficult thing to do. Um, and uh, we only have limited, who else has won a third term for their party except for George H.W. Bush in the last 50 years or so? No one, I think. Um, but I, one reason, I mean, part of the reason why she has good prospects for doing so is, are obviously, is obviously the implosion of the Republican Party. Uh, but the other reason is because Barack Obama has been on the whole, and against all odds, a very successful president. Um, I'm ta happy to to back up that argument in Q&A or perhaps another talk. But in any event, um, Donald Trump's America, the one I'm looking at today, doesn't look like such a bad place. Uh, there are worrying signs. Uh, 
Al Applebaum, I think, is right to worry about the fragility of the liberal consensus. Ross, I never know how to pronounce his name, the most interesting conservative writer, one of the most interesting conservative writers in the U.S., New York Times columnist, Ross Dutat, Dutat, however you pronounce it, um, suggests this is a good warning for us because if authoritarian politics changed America, this is what it would look like. Dana, thank you very much. Um, it's been a shocking rise and we're still trying to get to grips with it, but I think that helped. Um, we've got half an hour for questions. Uh, we'll take uh, three at a time. Please introduce yourself at the start of the question. Yes, sir. Hey, Andrew Brooks. Um, it's, it's, I think it was Mark Ferguson who's trying to relate to the 1860 uh, convention where William Seward was the head of the game between the then A. Lincoln sort of picture of the <coughs> Um, but at the end of that, in order to placate Seward, he had to be given the job of Secretary of State. Um, is Secretary of State <laughs> any better than the worst? Than, and if he didn't, he'd have to be given something. Well, how, how do you see that panning out? Ben. Okay. <laughs> ben Barry, one of the Institute's staff. Um, Dana, under what circumstances do you think we could see a President Trump? And would you like to apply a sort of probability value to that? Because it seems to me that um, even in democratic, one of the other things about the age we're entering is in democratic <coughs> countries there are more and more surprises. Three great questions. Uh, well, Seward <laughs> was a very serious Secretary of State, and um, I mean, I think the analogy is to what came before that election, which was the demise of the Whig Party, and um, which was, and, and it, it's it's an interesting question about whether the Republican Party. Could, could cease to exist or could cease to exist in its present form. Uh, many Republicans have, have, have said that this will be the end of the party if Trump is nominated. Um, they'll, they'll, you know, there's talk of a third party, um, of backing a third party, and then who is, which is your party? Uh, I, I don't... <laughs> uh, a deal between Ted Cruz... I mean, since, the, since together they have... I, actually, your question is, is very interesting now that I think about it, simply because um, a majority of delegates could be organized around, for example, a Ted Cruz nomination based on some sort of deal. Um, I hadn't really thought about it in specifically those terms. Uh, at the beginning of this process, Ted Cruz was um, hugging Trump very close. I mean, they 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 were on a platform together uh, at a rally, at least at one rally in opposition to the Iran nuclear deal. So I was about to dismiss your question, and now that I think about it, um, who knows? Um, the probability pro the probability question is easier because I'm just not going to answer it. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> You know, I think it is by definition a black swan kind of event. Something happens. Um, something terrible, you know, personally terrible happens. I mean, you know, Hillary Clinton is not a young woman. Um, who knows? But uh, uh, it, is in within, it is within the realm of possibility. That's all, that's all I can say. Now, would he be constrained? No norm of politicking or even self-interest has constrained, constrained him yet. He, he's proven incapable. He sort of indicated and realized at a certain point when he was really cruising to get the nomination uh, that he needed to start appearing more presidential. He, he, he jokes about the fact that his wife and daughter tell him this. 
uh, but he shows himself incapable of doing it. Uh, so I would not be particularly sanguine. Again, early in this campaign, some uh, centrists and even liberals were saying he might be the least bad, uh, from their point of view, the least bad solution. A, because he'd almost certainly lose, but B, even if he won, he's not so dogmatic on, on, on issues that are... Um, uh, you know, on a dogmatism that I think has has really um, constricted and, and, and crippled Republican policy thinking. So you can tell, I mean, even I w w was flirting with this idea. Uh, he would make, you know, he would make deals for it, and this was the idea. But I think now that we've, any such suggestion in my mind is, um, is outweighed by his recklessness and, you know, genuinely authoritarian uh, instincts. Um, his, his language is the language of violence. Um, his political language is the language of violence. So I wouldn't um, count on him reverting to some more um, acceptable face once he was sworn in. Thanks, Dan. Uh, yes. Thank you, Senator. <coughs> Gordon Wilson, oh. uh, a local um, member here. Um, from what you said about free trade, are you saying that concepts like TTIP and TPP are really dead in the water and what, whatever gets in, whatever uh, orientation it means, uh, will perhaps be very in the heart, they be torn? No, I'm not saying they're dead in the water. Um, although, you know, I, I really don't know enough about the, the, the vote count on uh, the TPP uh, to know what's going to happen. Um, I think that it's conceivable that TPP could go down and TTIP, it, it might be necessary at that point for um, uh, senators and congressmen to, I guess it's only in the Senate, right? It's a trade treaty. Yeah. Uh, for senators to uh, want to show their free trade credentials so by compensating with, with TTIP, which is not, you know, does not raise the same, same kinds of issues about low wage competition and so forth. Um, so no, but I'm not predicting either of them, the, the demise of either of them. What I am saying is that um, something very limited, which is limited mainly by my knowledge of the field, but my sense is that we do have to take seriously the fact that, um, you know, how many years? 25 years after NAFTA. Uh, it's a very dirty word in the, in, in the industrial Great Lakes, in the mid Middle West. So if it was going to be an unalloyed success for people who are, need to be convinced of this, um, somehow it hasn't convinced them. Uh, now, what their problem is may have very little to do with free trade and have, may have more to do with, uh, with a hollowing out of middle class employment and middle class wages that could have a lot of factors. And I'd be very worried about that in the future. Um, and I know I sound like a Luddite in this, but I, I think the artificial intelligence problem is a real, is a real threat in this regard. Um, it's not a threat to our economies. It's going to make us all much richer. I mean, in, in aggregate, it's just a question of distribution of that wealth. I think that's Jonathan Marcus in the row behind. Yes. Oh, no, not really. oh, oh it isn't. Sorry. Sorry, I'm actually the working with Jonathan in the front office. Uh, one <laughs> question I have really Close. is: uh, it's not going to be Trump winning the nomination, therefore it has to be Ted Cruz, and I think that's pretty well agreed now. There's no going to be a white knight coming from outside. So are we going to have a sort of session in three months' time when Ted Cruz is America? Because actually that's one that looks quite a bit more conservative, strictly speaking, than, than Donald Trump's. And I was wondering about the link between the Republican establishment, who until very recently have taken uh, an arm's length or even further from Ted Cruz, now beginning to sort of get ready to embrace him somehow, uh, and if you like, try and mold him. So I wonder if just we've underestimated Trump so far in the primary, or we underestimating Ted, Ted Cruz in the general. And unless I really need glasses, that's Nigel Inkster in the front row. 
you do. And that they <laughs> right. Yeah, sorry, uh, Dana, a two-part question, if I may. Um, on the subject of uh, Hillary Clinton, in, 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 uh, so it's a uh, strong likelihood that she will win the Democrat uh, nomination and the uh, probability that she may well uh, secure the presidency. Um, a second example of dynastic politics in the United States that would seem to run somehow counter to the ideals of the founding fathers. Does this matter? Is this something um, of concern that, we, you know, that America should be concerned about, or anyone else for that matter? And uh, secondly, uh, in the event of uh, Hillary Clinton becoming um, <coughs> the next president, um, does she actually have any big ideas of her own? Obama arguably has. If, you know, if, if she has, what do you think they are? Yeah, that's three questions, so fair enough. Um, I think you're probably right that if it's not Trump, it will be Cruz, although we're in un 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 uncharted waters. Uh, if, 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 it, you know, if it's an open convention, it could be an open convention. But the problem is, uh, I mean, evidence for your assumption is that people talk about brokered conventions. But as someone said, this, you know, this, 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 this party doesn't look like it could organize a two-car funeral at, at this point. I mean, um, and uh, so its ability to broker anything is questionable. If Ted Cruz is the nominee, he will be the most conservative Republican candidate since at least Barry Goldwater. Um, and um, there are some arguments that he is more conservative than Barry Goldwater. Uh, I think that he will lose because, I mean, well, first of all, he's, he's clearly very talented. He's hugely intelligent. He's amazingly disliked by his um, by his party, at least by the elected officials of his party. Um, there was a piece by Peter Beinhardt a few days ago, which struck me as rather wise. Um, the party should get behind him. It's his, he's, a, he's their best option, and I'll tell you why. I'll, I'll tell you why Beinart said this, but I kind of agree with it. Uh, he will lose, uh, you, know, you know, subject to the obvious caveat that I have no idea what's going to happen next week, much less in November, but I'm, if I'm confident about anything, he's probably not much less likely to lose than, than Trump. Uh, but he will take, he will, he will, represent a defeat for extreme right-wing republicanism that I suspect the Republican establishment um, could see the value of. Uh, then you could return to, you know, the sort of the Mitt Romney center, uh, but allow the Mitt Romney center to be genuinely centrist, which Romney really wasn't able to be, despite his instincts. Uh, and so, you know, you, I mean, this is, again, uh, this is two, three steps or four steps of organization and strategy that is probably, <coughs> you know, beyond what most people could accomplish or most parties could accomplish, but it makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, so, uh, so that's Cruz. Um, dynastic politics. Well, it's not the first dynasty. Um, some, some, at one point, I read, I mean, I'd have to rethink this, but I think there has been a Bush or a, um, oh no, I guess McCain and McCain. Up until, up until George W. Bush's, um, um, the end of his term, there had been a Bush or a Dole on every Republican president, every Republican candidate candidacy going back to 19, when, when, when was Bush first there? No, when was Dole? 76, 76, right, 76. Um, so there are dynasties in American politics. It's not particularly egalitarian or democratic, I agree with you. Um, Hillary Clinton, however, is, um, 
how shall I put it? She is uh, has been on the national stage now. I mean, she was elected in her own right in 2000. Um, she tur turned out to be a pretty effective uh, senator. Was it 2000? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, she was Secretary of State. I mean, I, you know, I, it, it, it's not as though she is simply the wife of a former president. That's, that's all I can say about her. Um, does she have any big ideas? Um, she's not a visionary. She's not an ideologue. Um, I think she, she has a view, I think she has inherited from her husband or, or part of her experience, part of their joint experience, is the idea that American politics is a slog, it's trench warfare. It's not, Bernie, Bernie Sanders has big ideas, although they're not particularly um, detailed. Uh, but his main idea is the idea that this is going to be uh, implemented through something he calls a political revolution, which we're not, you know, we are not having political revolutions in the United States. It's, 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 a, it's a fantasy. Um, and, you know, in, in this sense, I think her realism is, um, you know, it's not inspiring. But, uh, but it's serious. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, it must have to give me a Japanese freelance journalist. If possible, I'd like to have uh, two questions. So uh, could you make a comparison between a uh, U.S. presidential campaign and EU referendum in the term of, of white anti-elite backlash? And the uh, second question, uh, this project is, is still going on or after a presidential election and uh, disappearing. Sorry, what's going on? So, oh, oh, so this trajectory. So, oh, this trajectory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're talking about the British EU referendum. I guess that's the only one right now. <laughs> I want to add a question okay. to that because it relates to the same thing, which is that if there was one, if there was one takeaway of the Republican establishment after 2012, it was that with the demographic change in the United States, the next Republican nominee for president had to appeal to Latino voters. And this was the one major, major change in that. After the defeat of a white billionaire um, uh, and the, the failure to pick up any Latino votes, <coughs> things had to change the next time around. And the front runner is now a white billionaire who hates Mexicans. Uh, what happened? <laughs> Were the is it can you is it just that Rubio and Bush were two bad versions of the candidate that the Republicans should have nominated, and that's why they failed, or is it simply impossible for the Republican Party to nominate for a candidate to win the Republican primary and appeal to the um, portions of the electorate that Republican needs Republican Party needs to win a general election? Is it actually possible? <clears throat> and then in the back row, yes. Oh, so, yes. Um, um, there are two lines sort of baselining the underlying forces driving Trumpism. And you mentioned that many of them are new. And I completely agree with you on that. The sort of American Party to America first to sort of Hofstadter-esque paranoid style. I mean, you can trace this throughout American history. How much of that is not new, and then how much is, is really new, a product of globalization that we described, you know, stacked on top of that? And I guess the final part of that question is, how much of that sentiment do you think is actually mitigatable with public policy measures? Because the, the response to Obamacare, for instance, among a large segment of the populace that's actually benefit from Obamacare has been, yeah, Obamacare is pretty pretty good, you know, in terms of what it's given me, but I oppose Obamacare. So can you explain that paradox? Well, I think that um, starting with the first question, is there any comparison between the US presidential campaign and uh, the Brexit movement? Uh, I want to be a little bit careful here. I'm not sure why. Um, 
I mean, l l let me back up a, a moment and say, you know, obviously there has been a, um, a discomfort among parts of the British political class with EU membership that, in my view, doesn't really go to the nature of British interest and, and connection to the EU, but has been persistent. Um, you know, the, you know, the Conservative Party has remained deeply divided on it. Um, uh, Matthew, in a piece he wrote recently, quoted um, you know, this, one of Cameron's early speeches where he was saying, you know, the British public are tired of us. You know, they're, they're worrying about schools for their kids and child care and, and their jobs, and we keep on rattling on about Europe. Um, and we, you know, so he, he genuinely thought this was a problem, but they're still rattling on about Europe. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is, con is make a concession to the discomfort of this relationship with Europe for. I don't quite understand it, but that I'm not British. Um, so um, uh, what it does, uh, and, and, and so therefore, you know, it seems to me that what the possibility that uh, the referendum re result is going to be for Britain to li leave the EU it's, is probably more contingent than the, the, the than a than a reaction to. Um, to the same forces that are driving Trump, although that, as I say that, I realize, of course, immigration is a big issue for <coughs> both. Um, so that's not a, that, 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 that's a um, that's an unclear answer. And then the, the one thing the one thing that strikes me that they both have in common is a kind of isolationism. Um, it, I'm, I'm, I'm struck and I'm dispirited by the fact that the debate about Brexit in this country seems so purely transactional. In Donald Trumpian terms, if I can, you know, if I can go so far, that's what's in it for Britain, without really thinking about the consequences for, you know, the, as Anne Applebaum was saying, the consequences for a wider uh, European and, and transatlantic community. Um, The trajectory post. Uh, let me. Uh, I think I've tried to talk about that, and the reason you don't think I have is because I haven't given a very clear prediction. But I, I'm not going to try any harder. Um, although, in in response to uh, Matthew's question, uh, well, why? Um, I mean, this is. I th I think th I think the y y your question was about. Why was it that the, when the Republican establishment saw so clearly and wrote a paper about it, and a, a strategy paper stating that it needs to appeal to, to Hispanic voters, why was it inca incapable of pulling this off? Um, I think it has partly to do with the, with the coincidence between... Um, I, well, let's look at it in, in, across three dimensions. First of all, you know, maybe um, non-college edu educated whites are, if they're not directly competing and being squeezed by immigrant labor, they certainly perceive themselves to be. So I, here I want to grant them, give them a little bit credit. I don't really know, you know, just as with free trade in the aggregate, you can say it's good for the country, whether it's good for particular segments of the country, I'm not. I don't know, but certainly I think they're convinced that it's not. Secondly, there's the race, the, the racial side of that, which is that um, people whose uh, prospects seem diminished in various ways also notice their country changing around them in ways that maybe they associate with um, with that diminishment of their prospects. So it's not a particularly attractive response, but it's not completely surprising either. Um, and this was just a very potent mix. They, they, the, 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 the Republicans who believed that you had to open up to Hispanics, I mean, we can go back to the early Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, when um, uh, Karl Rove was convinced that this increasing Hispanic population was naturally conservative. Um, 
very devoted to family, Catholic. Now, actually, I think he's wrong. Was wrong about that even then because polls show they're not anti-statist and statist in the way that you know the Republican Party is. Uh, but nonetheless, it certainly doesn't help if if it becomes clear that your constituency and your own leadership's rhetoric suggests that you really don't like these people very much, don't want them there. Um, so they tried to change that, and they found too much anger in their base and too much ability of people like Trump to appeal to that anger. I don't know if that's a sufficient answer, but it's the best I can do. Um, <coughs> on the question of whether the, the Trumpism is a reflection of uh, enduring factors in American politics or a response to globalization. It seems like both. And so, uh, you know, I've already described my worries about globalization and really in terms of the structure of technology and the economy. So I'm not sure I have anything to add, add to that. Uh, but that does seem to some, me something that we really have to worry about strategically in the future. Um, and could there be a future authorit authoritarian uh, constituency and reaction to that? You betcha. I think, I think there certainly could. Uh, but Trumpism, look, it's not, um, it's not particularly surprising. If it, I think he's enjoyed 30, something like 35 percent. He's had a plurality of the popular vote in the Republican primary process so far of about 35 percent. Is that right? 35% of, let's say, 40% of Americans is what? Um, it, 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 it's a, you know, in a country that was officially organized on racist principles when I was, when I was a boy, it's not hugely surprising that racist appeals are still resonant with, with a minority. It just happens to be a mi minority that um, is something like a plurality in, 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 in the Republican electorate right now. Uh, the, the innovation is, is the willingness of leadership to appeal baldly to it. And um, so there's nothing inevitable about that in my view. It's, 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 it's the decision of one man and some other men. Thanks, Sammy. Well, we're absolutely bang on time, so I will wrap it up there. Um, this has been a race that so far has defied prediction, but I think you made a convincing case for your two predictions, one of which was a big win for Trump in New York, and the other one was probably not Trump um, for the Republican nominee. Um, so there's a grain Actually, of hope did in I there. Say, I don't think I said probably not Trump for the Republican nominee. No? No. I think I'm, I said not Trump. Not Trump for president. For president. Almost certainly um, not Trump I, for president. I, I'd say I'd give him even odds still, as, at least. Even odds for Trump. So if you see better than... For the nomination. For the nomination. the nomination. If you see better than even odds for Trump on the nomination, rush to your nearest bookmaker. <laughs> right. uh, thank you very much for, you, uh, for all your uh, interesting and intelligent questions. And please join me in thanking Dana uh, for his talk.